2.9. And as a vector of x there, is that x, is x being represented in the basis that they give us, or is that x in the standard? Um, yes, it's the standard basis. Okay, so I need to convert it to that basis. Thing. Yeah, so they don't mean E1 there. They don't mean X equals E1. Yeah, yeah well, because like I said, it's kind of easy if, <laughs> if, they, if, they, if they mean that. Yeah, it's hard, hard to explain, yeah. So, so X is the I don't need to convert it to That's just, yeah, the, the coordinates of R3, yeah. standard coordinates of R3. All right. Okay. Did you, anyone else have any questions? Everybody's saying they did an all-nighter on this thing. Well, I did, because I was doing it. <laughs> oh, no, I, man, I was working forever, even just on that first one. I think I finally got something. I wanted to talk to you maybe after class. Okay. I was wondering if we could, if I could turn mine in maybe Monday, because I've only got a few problems done at this point. Yeah, that, that would work for me. Okay. Okay, so maybe we're going to have to uh, make our homework do Mondays. Yeah, but then I'm going to hit you with another assignment on homework five. And you're going to say like, oh no. <laughs> I wouldn't mind honestly, but I mean I don't want to pull the class. Yeah, yeah no, no, I, I mean just an exceptional case that you want. So I mean Thursday's just been working fine, so this is kind of hard. Okay. Thursday's is better, I okay. think. Okay. Okay. Good. We're going to stay with Thursday, so um, yeah, everybody gets one. Okay, maybe two. Late ones. Okay. So if you need it, if you need it, if you need it late on this time, that's fine. Okay. I think the Hilbert space problems next week aren't going to be too bad. Three one and three two. Uh, two ten has one hard problem. Okay. We have to compute the dual. We have a new homework assignment. Is it on the web or? Cause yes, it is. Yes, it is. I believe the homework assignment for next week, homework four. Is um, 2.10. Let's see. It's um, <coughs> six and eight. He likes number eight. Eight is eight, eight is always a good problem. Six, six and eight. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be like for the rest of the course. Yeah, Numbers yeah. six and eight. If I needed to go blindly in, the, in assign problems, it would be six and eight. It would be six and eight. Okay. Now the only thing is for homework five, I've got six and eight for all three sections, but I'm gonna have to make sure that they're all doable. So before I assign it, I'm gonna make yeah, sure I get it written out. You like it? How do you? Is it a coincidence or are you just? It just turns out to be a coincidence because what happens on odd number problems, he gives an answer. Okay, and they're usually kind of easy. And then on the even ones, uh, he doesn't give answer, and they're not as easy. And I avoid 10 and 12 and 14, and so that pretty much leaves 6 and 8. Or sometimes 4, you know, if it's a decent one. But sometimes 4 is too trivial, too. The latter is so, too hard. Yeah, they just kind of get off into other things that aren't as central. Yeah, sure. You know. Sometimes they're applications, but um, anyway, there's... Sometimes he doesn't have any real bad thinkers, okay, that I can tell so far. Um, and then 3, 1, um, oh, I did put some odd ones on here, 3, 6, and 11. So that's a little bit of a different thing. So that's a little bit more fun. And then 3.2 and number 4. So there are some lower numbers. In a, and uh, so that's, these are really not difficult. I think there's only one difficult problem, and that's number 8 which I'm going to show how to do today, okay. basically, the method. Okay. Well, I think the problems, I don't know, I mean, I'm not aware, but I thought they were interesting to, to look at. Yeah. Just want to get the basic ideas down. And I, I also got some notes off the Internet from somebody who said they gave one paragraph to finite dimensional spaces. <laughs> he says these are not terribly interesting. But I think it was a good idea for this author to go through, go through all the finite dimensional case where everything can be done and illustrate the concepts and the uh, definitions. So, with that being said, why don't we go on and um, talk about the space of bounded linear operators. And really what we're going to do is we're going to look today at the space of bounded linear functionals. Okay, so the space of bounded linear operators and then for us for, for the whole day. Instead of operators, we're really going to talk about functionals. OK. 
functionals in particular. Because a functional is a bonded, a bonded functional is a bonded linear operator, where the range I mean, uh, is in either the reals or the complexes. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take let x and y in general be norm spaces. Denote b x y the set of bounded linear operators so now the domain is going to actually be x okay and so the norm is the norm is uh, what is, and now that's going to be a norm space itself this is self is a normed space with the norm of T is simply as it was before. It's the supremum over the uh, vectors x and x with norm x equal to 1 of Tx. Okay. Obviously you can take the scalar multiple of a linear operator and still have a linear operator. You can add two linear operators and still have a linear operator. And now we just need to check that the uh, axioms n1 through n4 of a norm hold. And those are fairly trivial. n1 was something like a check n1. These are the check axioms of a norm. So I just want to show that the, the norm of t satisfies those. One should be that the, it's not negative. Okay, that's trivial. Two should be t the norm of t equal to zero if and only if t is the zero operator. Okay, so I need to show that in particular, well, obviously the norm of the zero operator is zero. That was by definition. Um, and I need to show if the norm is zero, then the t is the zero operator. So let's just check that. All right, it's pretty trivial to check, but check that. If the norm of t is equal to zero, then what happens? Then the supremum norm x equals to one of tx is equal to zero. All right. That means that uh, the supremum of a set of non-negative numbers is zero if and only if all the numbers are zero. There can't be any positive number. Okay, if and only if tx is equal to zero for every vector x of norm one. Okay. Um, which means, okay, the only way the norm itself can be zero is if the vector is zero by the the n2 of the norm itself of the norm of a vector. Okay, this is a, this is the norm in the vector space in the norm space y. Okay, this is the norm in norm space y. So by n2 for the norm space y, for the axiom itself, you get the tx equals to zero for every vector of norm one. And of course, if tx is equal to zero for every no vector of norm one, then tx is equal to zero for every vector whatever by scaling because t is linear. Okay. Okay. So if only if that means t is equal to zero, zero operator. Okay. So a rudimentary check. And we see that uh, you have a zero operator. Uh, what's the only other interesting one? I think it's N4. N3. No, no. I'm seeing it. N3 is the triangle inequality. No, no. N3 is the scaling thing. That's trivial because you have T is scaling. So all that's. N3 is trivial. And N4 is the triangle inequality, is the norm 
of t1 plus t2. What is that equal to? That's equal to the supremum over norm x equal to 1 t1 plus t2 of x. Okay, which is equal to the supremum norm x use the linearity t1x plus t2x. Now I can use just the ordinary triangle inequality for the norm in the norm space y. And then therefore this is less than or equal to the supremum over all vectors of norm 1. T1x plus T2x, which in turn is less than or equal to the sum of the soups. We used that inequality before. And when we discussed C01, it's the same exact type of inequality. Less than or equal to the supremum norm x equal to 1. T1x. Because this supremum could be here. This here you have to have the same x, all right, and you make the sum of norms as big as possible. Here I get to use whatever x I want to make this as big as I like. Plus, then over here I can use a different x to make t2 x as big as I like. All right, so there's more freedom here, so the sum is bigger, and that is equal to the sum of the norms. Okay, so triangle inequality holds. Same idea as before. So there you have the, the uh, norm space. <clears throat> okay. So here's the, uh, the theorem of this section. Uh, then we have some, you know, then we, then we have another definition. If Y is a Banach space, So you add that the target space for this linear operator should be itself complete, y is complete norm space, then bxy is also a Banach space. Okay. So you don't have to assume anything about x other than it's, it's a norm space. Okay. So this uh, set, of bounded, set of bounded linear operators is itself a bonic space in that case. So let's just prove it. I'm going to move right to the scalar case already. I'm just going to go ahead and, and work with bonded linear functionals and go to the proof there because it's the same proof. That the, the scalar field is a bonic space. It's either the real line or the complex plane, right? It's a complete Norm space. Okay, so the, the proof will be identical. So let's just go ahead and work with the case. So proof for the case um, uh, x equals complex um, norm space. You're not going to see much except the absolute values, maybe. And uh, it's not going to make any difference in the notation. And uh, y is equal to the complex numbers. So then in that case, bxc. Yes? That's OK. That one's dead. Uh, I think this one does. Yes, I think this one does. Bold color. OK. Um, so then in this case, um, bxc equals uh, the bounded linear functionals. on x. So I just work in that case. Okay. So I just want to prove that's a Banach space. So what do I need to do? I need to take a Cauchy sequence in the bottom linear functionals. So let Fn be a sequence of bounded linear functionals that's Cauchy in the norm. Fn be a Cauchy sequence of 
bounded linear functionals. On X, I mean, okay, so that means, therefore, what that means is this means for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N so that the operator norm, okay, Fn minus Fm is less than epsilon right, for all M and N greater than or equal to capital N. Okay. You need to deal with that operator norm in this, in this homework, right? A little bit? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was what took so while. I need a counterexample. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> counterexamples always take a long time. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So now what do I want to do? What I want to do is I want to show that there's some limit. I need to find limit. All right? Show to show. There exists F, a bounded linear functional. So it has to be bounded. You have to have a finite norm with um, such that, such that the norm of Fn minus F goes to zero as n goes to infinity. I get convergence, okay, in this norm. Okay, so how am I going to do it? Well, you have to find a candidate. You just got to get, for each little x, I have to have little f of x defined, right? So I have to, you know, it looks just like f is a function or something, right? f is a function. <laughs> it's a complex valued function on x. So I uh, need to show, need to find, to define f of x. First I need to find the limit, okay? Because I actually have to demonstrate there is one here. All right? I can't use completeness. All right? I actually have to demonstrate something. So you need to find f of x okay, for every x and x. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, I already know that the complex numbers are complete. Right? And obviously, now I claim that fn of x, but fn of x is an ordinary sequence of complex numbers. Um, so let, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let x of norm 1, obviously. Let's see. Um, we don't even need to. I don't even need to do that. Ordinary sequence complex numbers. And what do you have? Let's take the, let's show that it's Cauchy. Show that it's Cauchy. Maybe I won't pull out the epsilon. I'll just, you know, rely on your... Good understanding. This is what I have f n of x minus f m of x in absolute value. What is that? Well, that's f n minus f m at x by linearity of the linear of the linear of the linear functionals f n and f m. Right? F actually that's not by anything. That's just by definition. Okay of the difference of two functions, okay? This is by definition of the difference of two functions. There's no linearity being used at all there. <coughs> okay, this now uses the fact that this is a bounded functional. This is less than or equal to the norm fn minus fm times the norm of x because fn minus fm is bounded. We just showed that we had a vector space uh, by the triangle inequality. Okay, the difference of two bounded functionals is again a bounded functional, right? Because you already have, you do have a norm space. That's what this triangle inequality was about. Okay, the bound is the sum of the bounds. Okay, it's bounded. 
But of course, what I've already assumed is that this is actually bounded nicely because you already assumed you had a Cauchy sequence, so it was actually less than epsilon, right? Which is less than epsilon x. Okay, so if x is norm one, therefore you got the Cauchy sequence, okay? And there's a Cauchy sequence for any x, in fact, all right? But for any fixed x, is a Cauchy sequence. Okay, so. So Cauchy sequence verified. For any fixed X. Okay. So that means it converges. Therefore, because C is therefore because C is complete. Limit n goes to infinity fn of x exists and is equal to f of x. So I, knew how, I now have a candidate. Okay, is, that a, is it a linear functional? And then we'll worry about whether it's bounded at first. Is it linear? Is f linear? Well, by the limit laws, yes. Because fn is linear. So fn of x plus well, fn of x1 plus x2 is fn of x1 plus fn of x2. You have two sequences, both of which have a limit. Therefore, by the limit laws, the limit of a sum is a sum of limits. You get that f of x1 plus x2 is equal to f of x1 plus f of x2. I'll write it down. Limit f. So we have f of x1 plus x2 equals limit fn of x1 plus x2. That's how it's going to be defined. n goes to infinity by linearity of fn. Now I do use linearity. Limit fn x1 plus fn x2. n goes to infinity. x1 and x2 are just two vectors linearly independent. <laughs> okay, ones. Say. Doesn't matter if they are or not, okay? Which is a sum of limits because you have a limit of a sum as a sum of limits. Again, because you just have a norm space. C is a norm space, <laughs> okay? It's true in any norm space, any metric space. Practically, well, well, norm space because you don't have the limit. Metric space might not have the sum structure. <clears throat> but any norm space, you have the limit of the sum of the sum of limits. Okay? It, which is equal to f of x1 plus f of x2. Okay, so it is linear. Of course, we can do the scaling property too. All right, now is it bounded? That's the only tricky part of the proof. And so what are you going to do? You're just going to take, here I'm going to kind of short shrift it. Give it, well, let epsilon be greater than zero. Okay. And uh, let x, this time I will choose x to be norm one. Okay. I want to show um, that, that, that f is bounded. Okay. What I have is that, um, Fn minus f at x. Okay, how could I actually take the absolute value of that? I want to take the soup of this uh, overall x of norm one. Okay, to show that Fn minus f is bounded. If I can show Fn minus f is bounded, then I'll show that f is bounded. Right? If I have Fn minus f norm finite, that will imply that f norm equals the norm of f minus fn plus fn less than or equal to the norm of f minus fn plus the norm of fn okay is finite okay so all I need to show is that f is bounded it's really all I need to do uh, and so I need to show that fn minus f is bounded that's enough because I already know that fn is bounded 
So what is this? This is the, um, let's see, if I take the absolute value of a difference of two complex numbers, one of which is a limit, I can write that as the limit of uh, the absolute value of fn of x minus fm of x. What am I using here? m goes to infinity. Okay. What am I using? I'm using it if I have uh, a complex number c n and I have a complex number uh, d, okay, where d equals limit dm, okay, then absolute value, then I can write that as the limit m goes to infinity of cn minus dm. So, so cn is just fixed, okay. Um, well, I guess I need to prove that little lemma that I could do that, okay. <laughs> That's almost trivial. Um, really, it's just a little shift on. Uh, let's see. Uh, actually, no. That's just that's just uh, continuity of the norm, right? Yeah. Because this, the absolute value is the norm, right? And so here I have a vector c n minus d, which is the limit of c n minus d m. So what I'm saying is if 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 uh, in a norm space, if I've got x m going to x, then the norm of x m goes to the norm of x, right? That's the continuity of the norm. We proved that by reverse triangle inequality or something like that. Okay, there, that's exactly what I've got here. This is the norm. This is the this is the x here. C n is fixed. Okay, and that's a vector. So this is just a constant. This is a constant vector minus a limit, okay? So cn minus dm is the xm, okay, the xm, okay, okay, and x is the cn minus d, okay, so that's the norm. All right, so this with this little aside, finished, okay, then you have this, and so what do you get? Um, on the other hand, this is this is always less than or equal to. So this is equal to this is less than or equal to the limit m goes to infinity. This is less than or equal to the norm f n minus f m uh, times the norm of x, which has one. Okay. So I, there is uh, the I'll just put less than or equal to the soup over m. M uh, greater than or equal to capital N. You might as well take little n bigger than capital N. Let little n be greater than or equal to capital N, where capital N was the capital N we had over here. Okay, in the definition of the Cauchy condition for the original sequence. So let me sneak in a little n bigger than capital N, and I might as well assume in this limit that um, M is greater than or equal to capital N. All right? So I have m greater than equal to capital N, and I have n greater, greater than equal to capital N. Just throw that in, too. Okay? So any one of these, in, in particular, if I just take this thing, this absolute value expression, okay, and replace as an upper bound this quantity, this is a constant. This is a constant. Okay? It's bigger than any one of these numbers. This is a constant. Everybody see this? It only depends on capital N. This constant is bigger than any one of those numbers. All right? The limit of the constant is trivial. Okay? There is no limit. All right? So in the limit, M goes to infinity. Um, I may as well assume that uh, M is greater than equal to N. It doesn't matter. Okay? All right. So, and this is equal to epsilon, or this is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay? Because for every n and m, fn minus fm is less than or equal to epsilon, less than epsilon, so the soup might get up to equal to epsilon. That's the most you can have. Okay. 
That's the thing with epsilon for all x of norm 1. Okay? So that means that, therefore, fn minus f is less than or equal to epsilon for n greater than or equal to capital N. The norm is less than or equal to epsilon, so that's what I wanted to show. That's sufficient to show that f is bounded, and moreover, in the same stroke, that the limit of fn is equal to f in the norm. Therefore, f is bounded, and in the same stroke, limit fn minus f in norm is equal to zero. Okay, so use the, the capital N that I need for my epsilon is the same capital N. The only difference being that here I had a less than epsilon, there I've got a less than or equal to epsilon. All right, <laughs> so I need to go to epsilon over two if I want to do the strict, you know, inequality. Okay. All right, so there it is. There you have that. Uh, you have the Banach space. Okay, so then that brings up another definition. Then we had the the dual space, the algebraic dual space was just the set of linear functionals, bounded or other, uh, not yeah, bounded or not bounded, just all possible linear functionals. Here we're going to take the that was the algebraic dual. Now we're going to take the dual without any qualifying as just the set of, or as the uh, Banach space of bounded linear functionals. Okay, and now we're, then we're going to go ahead and compute some duals, or at least one. Okay, so definition dual space. Um, this is dual space of a norm space X is X prime equals the bounded linear functionals, the Banach space of bounded linear functionals. on X. It's automatically a Bonnet space by this theorem we just proved. So that's kind of interesting because we're going to compute a dual and automatically what you can show is you can prove certain spaces are Bonnet spaces by showing that it's a dual of another space, a norm space. So duals have to be Bonnet spaces. And now, what is to show one dual is, is equal to another space? Let's say we have already. Okay, that's going to be kind of the technology. You want to talk about be able to talk about isomorphism of norm spaces. So we're going to have to think in this. We talked very briefly about isomorphism of vector spaces last time. An isomorphism is just a bijective mapping between two vector spaces that um, well, well, where's a linear mapping, okay? It's a linear operator that's bijective. Okay, one-to-one -one onto. What do we want for a isomorphism of norm spaces? Yes. <laughs> so you're going to have uh, some mapping T from X to X tilde. X and X tilde are going to be norm spaces. It's going to be bijective and linear and bounded. Okay. And it's going to have um, uh, the norm of TX equal to the norm of X. For every x. Obviously, then the norm is 1. Okay? Okay. So 
So it's going to, the fact that it's bounded is going to come out of the fact that it's obviously going to have norm 1. And so that what you have is therefore, A, you get an isometry between these norm spaces as vector spaces. So T establishes an isometry in particular between X and X tilde viewed as metric spaces. So it gives you the equivalence of them as metric spaces as well. In a strong sense of an isometry, that means that the distance between two objects, two vectors, x1, x1 tilde and x2 tilde in the tilde space, okay, is equal to um, x2 minus x1, their pre-images in the original space. Okay, by the linearity of t, x2 tilde is t of x2, x1 tilde is t of x, let's check that, uh, x2 tilde, check, x, x2 tilde equals t of x2, x1 tilde equals t of x1, and therefore x2 tilde minus x1 tilde is equal to the tx2 minus tx1, use the linearity and write that as tx2 minus x1. Okay, and therefore when I write the norms on there, then this according to the uh, norm equality is equal to x2 minus x1 norm, okay, using the definition. Okay, so there's the isomorphism, and so when, we, when we're going to talk about equality of dual spaces, we're going to uh, talk about it in terms of this type of e equivalence, a norm equivalence, oh, exact norm equivalence, <laughs> okay. All right, so the first example that we're going to do, we're going to do a couple examples here of computing dual spaces. The first one is just showing that the dual of Euclidean space is itself Euclidean space. So Rn prime equal Rn is the 2.10-5 Okay, so let's see what this means. So we're going to use the following thing. Let F be in Rn prime. Okay, suppose we have one of these dual things. Okay, so in particular it's, it's a linear functional on Rn. It's a linear functional on Rn. Okay. And it has to be bounded, so in particular, I mean, you already know that this, this dual uh, is contained inside the algebraic dual, Rn star. But in fact, they're the same. Okay, Rn prime is the same as Rn star. That, that was a theorem that every, uh, uh, that the linear functionals on a finite dimensional vector space are the same as the bounded linear functionals. Uh, that's something from section 270. Do you remember that? The linear functional. Oh, you probably didn't have to use it for your homework. Okay. But there was a 278, I believe, uh, no, 2.7-8 uh, if x is finite dimensional. It wasn't stated this way before, but now you can state it. Then x prime equals x star. Okay. But every linear functional is bounded, okay? There aren't any unbounded linear functionals. We did give some examples last time of unbounded, you had to do one in your homework, right? Thanks. Of an unbounded linear functional, okay? There are such things as unbounded linear functions, but in finite dimensions there are no such things, okay? <laughs> that was 278, okay? That was with that 
that that uh, the constant C that we had if you go through the proof. Lemma two four one. Lemma two four one gives this. What? Is that the one with the polynomial space? So so all polynomials over zero one or something like that. That it had that the word unbounded linear functionals. The derivative operator on that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the one you're talking about? Uh. The derivative operators. No, I think maybe it was one of the, the this problem number six from section two point eight was a case of an unbounded linear functional. Oh, this, okay. So this is talking about problem set. Problem set two point eight point six. Examples. I'm sorry. That hit was helpful. Two point eight point six was an un, you had an unbounded linear operator. In it. Yeah, I didn't get that amount. Either. You had another one? There was another one, surely, yeah. 2.8, 2.7.6, or 2.7.8 was also, was also an unbounded linear operator, right? The inverse was unbounded. Yeah, the, the forward operator was bounded, but the inverse was unbounded. That was another example, all right? So you've had some un, uh, unbounded linear operators. To, uh, two point, excuse me, unbounded linear functionals. Well, they, those were linear operators, though. Okay, but here I'm talking about linear functionals. So I think it was 2.8.6, 2.7.8, okay, and then of course uh, 2.8.6, all right, which was the unbounded linear functional, okay? And then I gave one in, in the example, so the note's three also. Note three, page three. <laughs> okay, I gave an example of uh, a space. The continuous functions on the unit interval with the um, L2 norm, okay, produced a, a subspace, uh, produced a, a norm space. Let's see, it wasn't a Banach space, it was a norm space, but there was an unbounded linear functional there, okay? Okay. So notes three, page three. There was another uh, unbounded linear functional. This is an operator, and these were linear functionals. Okay. So what does a, a, a linear functional look like? We already said what it looked like. It's just you take any f, if you take e1 through en, a basis of rn, then uh, you can then f of summation ci, well f of x, which will denote, which will write x as in standard coordinates c1 through cn relative to this basis. F summation ci ei. All right. If it's any linear functional, it has to be respecting this sum. I goes from one to n, which is summation i goes from one to n ci f of ei. And now what we'll do is we we'll just call the f of eis gamma one through n gamma n. Call uh, f of ei equal to gamma i. I goes from one to n. So f of x equals summation ci gamma i. Any linear functional must look like that. Okay, and automatically it's bounded. F is bounded automatically. Uh, F is bounded automatically by theorem 278. But I can actually check it here in the particular also by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Also by um, f of also by summation ci gamma i. Um, oh, I'm going to take the standard basis standard basis. So I'm going to take not just any old basis, but the standard basis. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the standard basis. So E1 is equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, and E2 is equal to 0, 1, 0, and so on. Okay. When we discuss linear 
executive functions we, we uh, discussed for any basis, but I can pick, pick my basis if I want to. And here I'm going to pick the basis to be a nice one to work this theorem, okay? Why am I going to do that? Um, because I actually want to know what the norm of x is, okay? In terms of like c's. I don't want to have to go through the, a bunch of, you know, linear algebra, <laughs> okay, to know what the norm of x is in terms of the c's. So what I have here also, f is bound automatically and also by the following inequality, the absolute value of this is less or equal to the sum ci squared to the square root, and then the square root summation. Actually, this is a real, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put absolute value here. ci squared, i goes from 1 to n. This is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, summation gamma i squared, i goes from 1 to n. Okay? <clears throat> Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But now this, this because I chose that nice basis, the sum of the square root of the sum of the squares of the uh, ci squares is just, excuse me, the sum, square root of the sum of the squares of the ci's is simply the norm of x. That's the norm of x. So this is the norm of x times the uh, square root of the sum of the squares of the gammas. Okay. So there's the norm inequality that I want, f of x. An absolute value less than or equal to the norm of x times a number. And that constant is therefore a bound for the norm of f. Therefore, norm of f is less than or equal to the square root of the summation gamma i squared. i goes from 1 to n. However, the norm is actually equal to that number because in the Cauchy Schwarz inequality, that equality can be obtained. How do I obtain equality? I attain equality by making sure that the xi's and the gammas are parallel vectors. Right? Take xi equal to gamma i. If I take xi equal to gamma i, then you get summation gamma i squared, and then a square root, and another square root of summation gamma i squared. Okay. And uh, it's equal. <laughs> okay. Right? This is an equal. This inequality becomes equality. Inequality becomes equality. When C i equals gamma i, i goes from 1 to n. Check it out. You're just saying the summation of a gamma i squared equal to the square root summation gamma i squared times the square root summation gamma i squared. Take this, okay. Therefore, the norm of f is equal to the sum square root of the summation of gamma i squared. Therefore, the norm of f is equal to that. i goes from 1 to n. Okay. So I've taken any f in the uh, Rn prime and I've written it this way, okay? Obviously what you have now is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the sequence gamma 1 through gamma n and f, all right? So any gamma 1 through gamma n in Rn and you have the f, all right? So we have a we have a one-to-one -one correspondence gamma 1 through gamma n in Rn corresponds uh, with all f equals f sub gamma 1 through gamma n in Rn prime. And what you also have is that the norm of gamma 1 through gamma n in Rn equals the square root summation gamma i squared, i goes from 1 to n, because that is the, the norm, right? in Rn is equal to the norm of f. So that's what I mean by this isometry. 
Obviously, it is a bijection because if I take gamma 1 through gamma n, a distinct gamma 1 through gamma n, it gives me a, a distinctly different uh, linear functional. Okay? You say there's got to be one least one coordinate different, okay, and therefore along that basis vector, the linear functional is going to evaluate differently. F of ej, not the same as the other f at ej, where the gamma j was the one that was different. Okay? So I get two different, two distinct linear functionals. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to establish that this is one to one, and it's on to. I want to make sure that it's one to one. If I take, check one to one. If gamma 1 through gamma n is not equal to gamma 1, let's call it prime through gamma n prime, okay, then gamma j is not equal to gamma j prime, some j, okay? Let's say, um, okay, therefore, if I define uh, Therefore, f of ej, okay, which is equal to um, is just equal to gamma j, okay, is not equal to f. If I call this gamma one through gamma n not equal to f of gamma 1 prime through gamma n prime, okay, at ej equals to gamma j prime, okay. So the two linear functionals are not the same. So f gamma 1 through gamma n is not equal to f gamma 1 prime through gamma n prime. So I don't know if the author went through that one-to-one -one business. Maybe he just kind of saw that it was clear. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there's the one-to-one. -one. So it's one-to-one -one onto in is this uh, it's linear also. Okay. You have to check that it's actually a linear relationship, right? Um, if I add two sets of gammas and I correspondingly add the functional. Okay. That's that's obvious. Okay. By the form. Okay. So let's go through one more example, which is where you're going to have to follow the same format for your homework. Okay. So let's do one where it's infinite dimensional. And then, okay, so here it is. Um, so what's the number of it? Two ten six. Example um, L one prime L one prime equal to L infinity. So it means isometrically isomorphic. Okay. In particular, if you know that uh, in particular that proves that L prime is a bonix. L infinity is a bonix space. Maybe it wasn't that hard to show in chapter one, but in particular that would be a a corollary of what we've done so far. That L infinity is a Bonnach space because it's the dual of something. Okay. Um, okay, how do you prove it? First, okay, to prove this, let F be an L1 prime. Okay. And to do to uh, understand what F is going to be, I'm going to use the fact that L1 has a Schauder basis. So I can represent X nicely. I want to represent a general element of the space L1. Use that L1 has a Schauder basis. What does that mean? 
the shouter basis is in fact E1 equals just like it is in, in uh, Rn. The sort of the standard basis vector is only here they go ad infinitum dot dot dot. Okay, E2 is 0, 1, 0, dot dot dot. E3 equals 0, 0, 1, dot dot dot. 0, dot dot dot. Okay? Etc. All right, why, what do I mean by a shouter basis? That means that if I take x, that x equal c1, c2, and so on, that's an element, that's a sequence in L1. The claim is that um, x, then x equals summation i goes from 1 to infinity, ci, ei. Now you say, well, that's trivial. And I say, no, it's not. Trivial in general, I mean, it's trivial in terms of thinking of the thing being represented. I'm going to put a C1 times 1, a C2 times the 1 in the second place, and so on. I'm just going to factor it out. But this is an infinite sum. What this means is that in the norm of L1, is convergence. It means x minus summation i goes from 1 to n, ci, ei, in norm, L1. Okay. Goes to 0, as n goes to infinity. Now, how do you check that? Well, indeed, um, what this is is a norm of 0, 0, up to 0, as many places as you want. Then you start with, let's say, Cn, Cn plus 1. That's what's left in the sequence after you subtract off the first n terms. I mean, take away the first terms, right, of the sequence. That norm is equal to Cn plus Cn plus 1, the definition of the L1 norm is just the series, which is the tail of a convergent series. Um, absolutely convergent series of an absolutely convergent, the tail of a convergent series summation Ci, I goes from 1 to infinity, okay? which is the L1 norm of x. All right, so it's the tail of the series, and so it goes to zero. Do you all know that the tail of a series goes to zero? Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, yeah, if, if, in general, if, if S, N is summation A, K, K goes from one to N, and S equals the limit Sn, that that's the that means if that exists as a limit, then that just means that the infinite series converges, okay, and therefore S minus Sn is simply the tail of that, and and then that goes to zero is equivalent to S go to Sn goes to Sn, okay. So it's just a notation that may bug you a little bit, but S minus Sn is the definition of the, of the tail, okay? Uh, exists then, of course, this, if and only if this goes to zero. Okay. All right, so do you do have a shouter basis? Now, by let me throw in a comment. That, give me the space that doesn't have a shouter basis. I claim L infinity doesn't have a shouter basis. Why would L infinity not have? Doesn't have this as a shouter basis? Because when I take this and I put the L infinity norm, it's it's big. Suppose all the C's are one. Then this is still one. It doesn't go to zero. So this is going to be, I cannot, it turns out that in this example, in computing the dual of L1, I'm not going to be able to repeat the steps in trying to find the dual of L infinity. The dual of L infinity, in fact, is a nasty thing. Okay. It's not nice. It's not a nice space. So everything is going to look like exactly like the dual of L1 is L infinity. Oh, by the same exact computation, dual of L infinity is L1. No. Nope.
because um, there's no shouter basis of L infinity. Okay. So I'm going to use that. Um, let's finish this thing. So, therefore, I can write x equals this infinite sum. Okay. Moreover, now, what is f of x? f of x can also be written out in terms of the infinite sum as follows. f of x, all right, well, here's two things. First, I'm going to so I have, I have the norm of f is finite because I've assumed that f is in L1 prime, okay? Now, take, in particular, um, therefore, f of gamma k in absolute value equals f of e k, all right, is less than or equal to the norm of f times the norm of e k, which in L1 is just 1, right? The norm of e k is 1 in L1 because the sum of the entries in absolute value is 1. This is 1 equals the sum 0 is 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 and so on, okay? That's what that is. So this is the norm of f. So therefore, what I have is that each gamma k, what is gamma k? It's just the f of ek, all right? So what I have is that I have generated um, a sequence, therefore, gamma 1, gamma 2, is uniformly bounded. Well, I mean, it's bounded in absolute value. It's bounded in absolute value by norm f. Okay. Each one of the elements is. Therefore, gamma 1, gamma 2, and so on is in L infinity. Okay. All right. All right. Now the claim is claim any uh, so what I have is that I have f corresponding I have f and uh that I generate this gamma 1 through through gamma infinity. I mean, like that. All right. Now claim any beta equals beta 1. I'm going to use different in L infinity defines a linear functional. I'm just use beta instead of gamma, so it's not too confusing. Okay, defines a linear functional bounded linear functional on L1. Check, check that. Indeed, summation, okay, what I have is that, as follows, f sub beta of x is equal to summation, k goes from 1 to infinity, ck beta k. Is that a good functional? Well, is it an infinite? Yeah. The Xs were assumed to be absolutely summable, right? Because Xs define the X. This is the L1. All right? So X is equal to Xc1, Xc2, dot, dot, dot. Okay? That's absolutely summable. All right? So, and this, the beta Ks are bounded. Okay? If I multiply a series by a bunch of bounded, con uh, by a, const, by a bunch of numbers, so, right? If I've got CK, if I've got summation, CK is finite, then I multiply by a bounded sequence, then I get summation CK, well, I have a comparison test, right? CK beta K in absolute value, less than or equal to some uh, upper bound uh, norm beta, in fact, times CK, which is the L infinity norm of beta. Okay, the supremum of the absolute values of the beta k. That's trivial, right? Term-wise, 
It's trivial. And so what I have is that by the comparison test, where I take the absolute values, and I bound each of the absolute values by this inequality, this is just a constant, this beta, the infinity norm of beta, and then I've got this CK, well, that's another convergent series, therefore. Okay? Therefore, by the comparison test, this is convergent. Comparison test. Absolutely convergent by comparison test. CK, beta K, an absolute value, less than or equal to CK times the norm of beta. I just wrote it down. Okay. So that's a good a good sum, all right? And obviously if I it's linear, all right? If I take x plus y, then I get a C plus an eta. Okay? The sum of infinite sums is is good. You can break it up. Sum of limits of the limit of a sum again. Alright? Okay. Moreover, I claim that I can, I can calculate the norm of this, this, this f beta, f beta norm, okay, as follows, obtain f beta norm as follows. Um, I have that f beta of x, an absolute value, less than or equal to the sum ck, I just did this calculation, k goes from 1 to infinity, times the infinity norm of the beta, okay? So this is a bound, the infinity norm of beta is a bound on the norm of f. So I have norm of f, so beta, <coughs> less than or equal to the beta infinity. It's the norm inequality. Okay. Now, one last step. Now, because The F in L1 prime we chose initially can be written be uh, written out as follows. Uh, now note that the F in L1 we chose initially can be written out as follows. Um, F. of x equals f of summation ck ek. I'm using the Schauder basis. I haven't used it yet. All right? I did not use the Schauder basis yet. Equals f of summation limit. What I mean here is just that that is a limit. K goes from 1 to n, CK, EK. That's the definition of an infinite sum. K goes from 1 to infinity. So this is the Schauder basis actually here. Where I actually write X as an infinite sum. And then I'm just using the definition of an infinite sum there. Now, I can pull the limit across because F is continuous. Being a bounded linear function is continuous. That was our theorem that bounded if and only if continuous. So this is the limit n goes to infinity f of summation k goes from 1 to n c k e k because f is bounded therefore continuous. And then that by definition of our gamma case is just equal to the limit summation ck gamma k k goes from 1 to n which is the sum the infinite sum summation ck gamma k so that all that infinite sum exists all right and it's just equal to the value of